Hello, everyone. Welcome to one of the last sessions here at the NDC. I hope you had uh, a good time the last days. It's, for me, it's really great to be back in in-person events after talking two years with the monitor. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I want to talk with you about security. And uh, the thing, if we talk about security, is normally that everybody has uh, this completely wrong picture in mind, right? So uh, from the movies we see, everybody sees one that is hacking like crazy at this keyboard and trying to attack a firewall. And the problem is this is not real life, right? You're, you're all developers, you know that nobody of you writes code like hackers in the movies are trying to brute force, uh, I don't know, a firewall. So in real life, hacking is completely different. And while people think it works like this, Normally, the hacker probably is calling your mother and trying to convince her to tell her how your first pet was named to reset a password from you, right? Or you are clicking on Facebook on some tests and to provide personal data that helps people to find other attack vectors. And what I want to do is like, I want to shift a little bit the discussion about security for developers. Because a lot of developers I talk to, they are like, nah, security is, I don't know, not for me. And I'm an expert and everything is safe here. And I want to shift a little bit the security and uh, make clear that we are all affected and we are one of the main attack vectors right now are developers, development environments and our applications. And we as developers, we are responsible for that. Of course, everybody right now always talks about uh, uh, Log4J and, and a lot of these things, but I want to tell another story, a much simpler story and much easier to understand. But it's a really great story because it shows how attacks today can occur, right? And uh, the attack I want to talk about is event stream. And event stream is, is so, such a good example because it contains all facets of a supply chain attack, right? It starts with social engineering. A new contributor to an open source project worked with them, helped out, and finally gained access to the repository and could push code. And uh, you have to know EventStream is a very popular NPM package on GitHub that is used in a lot of libraries. And one of them is uh, Copy. And Copy is an open source Bitcoin wallet. And Copy uses EventStream, so this one user took some time, contributed, worked with them until he finally got the trust and got commit message, uh, commit rights to the repository. And what he did, he introduced a new dependency to FlatMapStream. And FlatMapStream was a very simple uh, package. It was, uh, had one committer and only one file, so it was a little bit suspicious, but no malicious code. And people were talking about, why are you adding this dependency? And he just removed it and upgraded to a new major version, version 4. But of course, Copy did not update to a major version so soon. So there were still a lot of um, applications out there that were using the version 3. And then he introduced a malicious version of FlatStream Map. And that, of course, got published out to all the versions that had 3, uh, three point something installed. And what the uh, vulnerable code would do, what it was just check if you're a Copy user, more or less. So it was a direct attack on Copy, but using FlatMap Stream to get to EventStream and using en uh, social engineering to, to get into the repository and getting rights. And uh, so the vulnerable code would just check if you're a Copa user and if you would have more than, I think, uh, 1,100, I don't know, Bitcoins, 100, it would just harvest the Bitcoins, upload your code and everything to a control server. And you can imagine 100 Bitcoins, it's quite a money. So you can really spend some time social engineering for this kind of money if such an attack is successful. And this shows us a little bit how we have to approach security today. It's not just okay to have a firewall. It's not just okay to do a security review afterwards. We really have to be aware that security is everywhere in our development process. From the developer, development environment, the source code itself, the build environment, packaging, deploying, and let's, uh, at last step, the consumer, and of course, all the dependencies they're all vulnerable. They contain all vulnerabilities. And the vulnerability might only be there in a very short time so that it's really easy to hide it from the normal developer. And of course, all these dependencies have more dependencies and they have more dependencies and no, they have more dependencies. This is for just a small part of all the dependencies in Gatsby's. And of course, all of these dependencies um, have the same attack vectors, right? They all have environment, uh, built environments, they all have developers, they all have 
build system. So this is like a recursion here and a lot of attack surface that, can, that attackers can use to really get into your application. And if we look at uh, the losses we had over the last years, so last year we had 6.9 million um, losses caused by cyber attacks. So this is really a, a big trouble. And this is only the, the, the losses that are reported to IC3, right? So this is uh, the, the, the real number and, and the worldwide number is much, much higher. Just to give you, give you an idea where we are. And of course, the earlier you find the vulnerability in your code, the more insecure you are. So if, uh, the more cheaper it is, sorry. So if you fix a bug, a security bug, while you're developing, and it's cheap, right? It's just fixing the bug. If it's once deployed to an environment, it gets much more expensive. And if it's once in production and you're, you're breached, then the loss is millions. So, so the earlier you catch it, the cheaper it is. So that's why we say we try to shift left security and integrate it in the process as early as possible. So I want to go with you now through all the attack vectors in such a software supply chain or in your development chain and then just have a look at each one of them. The first attack vector is you, a developer. And a developer is a really good attack vector, right? Because probably you think, hey, what, what, what can go wrong? I'm just a developer, I'm just a normal employee. But normally with admin rights to a lot of systems, with admin rights to a very powerful local machine, with a ton of tools installed that really help if an attacker is already there. Um, you can modify code, you can execute scripts during the pipeline. So it's, uh, a developer is basically, yeah, it's not maybe not as good as an administrator, but really close to it. So you're a really powerful um, tool in an attack chain, I would say, right? And this is something you have to be aware of as a developer. Or, for example, unsecured connections to test system. Uh, a lot of my customers, they still have web servers in-house that are not secured, and they have basic authentication, and they send credentials to him, and they say, yeah, we have the production, that is secure, but here in, in the network it's not so uh, difficult, so people can fish it. So a lot of attack vectors around the developer themselves. One of the biggest is phishing. Phishing is still one of the biggest, um, yeah, of the most common um, attacks at all. And you can see here two phishing mails. One of them is a real, one is a, um, a simulation we did at the company. And a lot of people think, yeah, I know phishing. Yeah, I'm an engineer, so this does not affect me. But what people often forget is that people are primed, right? The more the attacker knows about you, the easier is it to give you a phishing mail that you fall for. An example, um, you log in every morning at nine o'clock because at nine o'clock everybody starts working, right? So everybody goes into the building at nine. So you as an attacker, you send a phishing mail at nine, at 10 minutes past nine, because this is probably the time the people are logging on. If you get a phishing mail that like says, okay, you have to verify your logging or something, and it's just, you're in the logging process, you're just primed. You don't look so carefully if this is a phishing mail or not, because they think, oh, I'm logging in, okay. Yeah. Ooh, extra security measure when you click on it. Or if you get paid every first of the month, we will send you this day a mail that says, hey, there was something wrong with your payment. Please click urgent here so that we can fix it. And there's some urgency. You're calculating with it. Oh, today is the day. And that's why you're primed and you will click on it. And I had a lot of colleagues that were like, ah, I don't know, phishing simulations. I don't need this. We're all experts. And in one or two years, like everybody of them clicked once on one, right? So maybe they did not enter the password, but if you have a malicious attachment, that's enough, right? If you have a malicious website, a click might be enough. And also, I clicked on once uh, because it was just priming. I was, uh, yeah, thinking about it, flip click. So phishing is still one of the main or the easiest entries into your network. Um, so what can you do if you have credentials of a developer, right? You can, for example, spare fish other people, right? So um, this is also an aspect from phishing. Um, phishing can be, of course, from, a, from an anonymous address. But if you once have leaked one in your company, you can spare fish someone else. For example, uh, if the phishing mail is, is like this previous one here, it's obvious. But if 
for example, um, our guy at the, at, the en at, the, at the entry desk in your company gets uh, breached and he sends you a phishing mail, then it's much more secure, but it's probably not from an external address and uh, people will click on it. And it's, if, you, if you as a developer send an email to an admin, the chance that he clicks on it, it will be pretty good because he said, hey, it's another engineer. I will probably click on it, right? So spare ship phishing is a very powerful tool here to get from one victim to the next one. Um, Mimi cuts. So if you have, as a developer, login rights to a lot of machines, test, test machines, developer machines, build machines, people can log on. And if you're a local admin, you can run Mimikatz. And Mimikatz will display you a lot of secrets from a lot of users on that machine. And a lot of people don't think about this, right? So the passwords are somehow in memory and you can read them, a lot of them. You can inject source code. So for most systems, one line of source code is enough to, to disable all authentication. So modify source code. Or if you can modify the pipelines or run pipelines, you can inject scripts or code and execute it in different environments. And yeah, if you have uh, access to test environments, you can log into the test environments and look, okay, do, for example, prod admins log in here uh, because we have the same admin accounts for prod and test. Then you can mimi cuts and get their credentials. Yeah. Or, yeah, other, for example, do we test prod? Do we have credentials here that go against prod and we can try to read them? And of course, if you're a developer and you have access to prod, and I see that a lot, it's game over anyway, right? So then, yeah, you're done. Yeah, but these are the, the obvious things, but there are also a lot of other things that people don't think of. For example, typo squatting. So what is typo squatting? Um, if you run npm install crossenv, then this will steal all your environment variables and send them up to a control server. If you install uh, click NPM, uh, or if you type npm install cross minus env, this is the real package what you want to install in reality. So this small typo will send all your environment variables up and you probably have some secrets there because you're testing uh, some APIs. So the attacker has your secrets. Or namespace shadowing. If you install npm install add Azure core tracing, then you have the real package. But if you just do an npm install core tracing, it will also upload your data to a server. And uh, this is something you have to be aware of because these are really powerful attacks and the packages often hide themselves. And then, uh, so, so it has different attack vectors, right? So it can attack you right away and send all your data to the cloud or to a control server. Or it can just shadow the other component and then just behave like the normal component. And you probably will not realize it if, you, if you're not checking and you, you ship it and then the attacker can also attack your application at runtime. So it's a really uh, yeah, uh, interesting way now to attack developers. So what can you do? Um, of course, uh, security awareness trainings, yeah? bringing a security culture. Yeah? People that say uh, or, or have uh, uh, doubts about something and, and care about security, they should not be the one, ah, he's always, uh, so, so you have to really allow this and create a culture of security. And the best thing is creating awareness training. Um, there are some security games that you can in, in, integrate into your sprint practices, right? So every end of the sprint, you do like a 10 minute, 15 minute game. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It's just to be something that should be always present to have all the awareness from the developers that security is not someone else's uh, topic, but it's, it's we developers that we have to make sure that our applications are safe. And not only on our dev machine, but also on test systems, on production. Yeah, it's all yeah, DevOps, it's our process, it's our application, it's our responsibility to make it secure. Red team, blue team simulations. Um, I don't know if you do this, um, only a few companies I know do it. So uh, you can also do like simulations where you simulate an attack, maybe with some external company and you simulate it and you can be part of the red team or the blue team. Red team attacks, blue team try to defend. Yeah. So this really gets up the awareness from people that, oh, so this is maybe easier to attack than I thought and uh, brings the awareness to the developers. 
And of course, make sure to have ephemeral containerized environments for builds, for development, and for everything. That if you, for example, file for typo squatting, it's not get, having admin access to one of your machines in your network, right? If you're in a containerized development environment or build environment or something, it's more secure and has not admin access and can get credentials from other people or other credentials from yourself. Development environment. So what can I do with a development environment? There are passwords normally in text files, in the environment variables. Uh, you can mimic cuts and, and read all kinds of secrets. You can modify build tools and attach to it to, to hack into the build process and then attaching um, yeah, vulnerable code to your actual code, yeah? like in, in the Sonar Wind attack. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, you can modify code that might be, get chipped or get committed without uh, the, the developer knowing it and you can modify pipelines and execute code. So this is what credentials in plain text files look like. And if a developer says, I've never done that, I think he's lying or I don't know, he's just working on public things, right? Um, I did it a lot because if you do end-to-end -end tests, if you want to automate, you will need some credentials somewhere and as, at least at the development environment, you have them somewhere in plain text in your, as an environment variable or in some code files. Other examples for credentials in test files. So I asked some colleagues and I said, okay, give me real world examples. And that's what they send me. So it doesn't matter if it's a token, auth token, user password, um, you will have credentials in text files living in your development environment. And this is an example of a project for me, open source project, quite old. And uh, of course, this does not contain a password. But you can search for it on GitHub, and if you find this on GitHub and you know someone is using this package, you, are no, you know for sure that on the development environment, you will find a copy of this file that contains the password, right? So even by inspecting public packages on GitHub, the source code, you can find um, some indicators that tells you if someone uses this package, he might have a, a file somewhere that has a credentials in plain text that you can read. Unsecured file shares. Yeah. Also, uh, yeah, it, it happens less. Now we have unsecured SharePoint <laughs> um, shares, um, but it's more or less the same, right? Somehow developers share things. Um, they, they, they have the files they share together. And if you scan for open file shares, you still find a lot at our customers. Um, Mimikatz. So I don't know if you ever executed it on your, your Windows machine. If you have a new Windows 10, it's protected. So um, your, your um, actual password cannot be read. If you have an older one, it can. But beside your normal Windows password, you get a lot of other information. For example, OAuth tokens um, that are in memory and that are currently used. I have, for example, here Office 365, my GitHub um, key here that you can read in, in plain text. Um, here, GitLab, GitHub, so a lot of tokens you can find out with, with, with uh, uh, Mimikatz. And not only for yourself, but for other developers, right? So at the moment, or for other users at the PC. So the moment you can to log into a development environment, you can see who else is logging in here. And if it's an admin or something, you might get the credentials of the administrator. So here's an example how an attack could work, right? You look you find an unsecured file share, you find a, a test credential that um, has access to a dev machine. You access the dev machine, you mimic cuts, and then you have the developer credentials, and then you can commit code, you can uh, execute a pipeline, a lot of possibilities from there. Sparefish other people. So once you have one victim, I would say, one credentials that you can use to log in into a machine, yeah, then you can just find your way to production by using different tools. For example, Bloodhound. So Bloodhound is a tool that you can run and it analyzes all your Active Directory traffic in your network and builds these graphs for you that help you see, okay, how do I come from dev to broad? And um, of course there are other tools, yeah, but uh, there's one. And here's an example how a chain uh, looks like, right? So you have a test account, for example, in your domain, a test account. You can log on a development machine where developer um, is active and you can mimic cuts the credentials. The developer might have access to a test environment. On the test environment, there is uh, an admin. So you have admin right there. 
mini cuts, and then you are at production. This is just an example, but this is why we have to be very careful with being like the entry point. And uh, as developers, we are under attack. We have typo squatting and things like that, so we have to be aware to not be here the entry point for people to get to broad. Yeah. And it's basically, um, yeah, Michael uh, V. Hayden. That said, fundamentally, if somebody wants to get in, they are getting in. All right, accept it. It's like this, and uh, we call this the assume breach paradigm. Right? It's in the past, we always said, okay, let's prevent breach, let's have firewalls, let's have a VPN, be secure, but, but inside these perimeters, in these layers, we are secure and we can do what we want. But with the assume breach paradigm, we say, okay, we are not secure in the perimeters. Why? We always have to assume we are already breached. Someone is already in there. I don't know if it's the developer. I don't know if it's the admin. I don't know if it's the service desk guy. Somebody might be in there, so we have to... Um, keep it zero trust. We don't trust anybody, so we meaning we have to enforce multi-factor authentication, secure socket layer for all servers, even internal test systems, right? Um, we have to separate our accounts and not log into uh, a test, test machine with our production credentials, right? So we have to separate the domains that if someone uh, breaches this machine, he does not get domain admin credentials, for example on at least privileges, that uh, you only use user accounts or the, uh, the, the, the permissions that you need in that moment to fulfill the task that you're doing. That you're not, for example, as a developer, work all day long as administrators. So who's working as a local administrator? Well, well that's good. Uh, one year ago, I think it was 90% people raising their hand and saying, oh, I'm a developer, I have to work as a local admin. And uh, it's good to see that it's getting less. Yeah. So what to do? Um, I think a really important part is having virtual development environments. Yeah? Having environments where people are not administrator but still can do their work. Um, ideally, so this can be a virtual desktop or something, that's fine. Uh, but ideally, it's specific to the project, right? For example, GitHub code spaces. If you have GitHub code spaces, you have one virtual development environment for each project. And you can pre um, pre-compile the images so you can spin up a new image in seconds. So GitHub is using code spaces themselves, so they have brought down their, their, the setup for their development environments for days, if not weeks, to a few seconds, right? So um, they, they had everything on the Mac before, and now they have code spaces, they have pre-compiled images, they have the code uh, installed per hand, and, and they spin up very fast, so uh, a new employee can just get in, spin up a code space, and can start coding. And in a secure way, because he's not locked in there, he does not his uh, emails there, so uh, the, the whole dev environment has far less attack vectors than a local machine with probably admin rights. Yeah. And of course, don't have local admin rights, so seen a lot of people don't yeah but you don't have it as an administrator you should not have it as a uh, developer only if you need it and you shouldn't need it if you need it go to a virtual uh, environment and create it there specific for this case yeah. and of course secret scanning there are a lot of secret scanning tools um, Depending on the file share, you, you can, can dumpster or you can uh, bash script it yourself uh, using some regular expression. You have Git leaks, uh, spectral orbs, a lot of things that you can integrate in Git. And uh, GitHub secret scanning is very powerful if you're using GitHub. For public repositories, it's for free. Um, it's, it's in there anyway, so you don't have to do anything. For private, it's uh, part of the advanced security. And GitHub is partnering with, I don't know, 70 people, 70 partners right now, and uh, is detecting secrets for them. And if you're using GitHub, you will see that every secret they have has a prefix. It's always like GHA or whatever secret it is, so that, Git, uh, so that it's easier for secret scanning to detect. And a lot of partners also do this, right? Amazon, um, Microsoft Azure, uh, all the secrets, they have some prefix, so it's easier to detect that it's a secret. GitHub will prevent you from pushing this. So it will, if you have push protection on, it will prevent you from pushing. It will uh, send you a URL, you can open it and then say, okay, I want to push anyway, it's a false positive or something, and then you still can commit. And GitHub at the back end will send the, uh, the secret to the partner to verify that it's not a false positive, that is there, and then the partner can decide what to do with it. 
uh, revoke it, rotate it, or does nothing just inform you that you have leaked a secret somewhere. Yeah, but secret scanning is a really important part to not have secrets lying around in code, in file systems, and anywhere. Attack vector supply chain. So your supply chain is not only your packages, right? So your supply chain is also all the software that you use to build your software, right? NPM, CI, .NET CLI, Terraform, all the other tools you have in your build system. So all tools involved in building your software are also part of the supply chain. And then, of course, your deep dependency tree under all the libraries you depend upon and the libraries they depend upon and so on and so forth. So, what to do? You have to know your dependencies. Um, in 2016, one library nearly broke the internet, so you could really note that day that something was off, and it was due to a small library called PetLeft. No, LeftPet. And LeftPet was a small library with 11 lines of code, and it did nothing but uh, adding a character before a string and filling it out with blanks or something else. So. This 11 line of code, every Java de uh, script developer should be able to write uh, on, their, on their own, right? But there was a dependency, not directly in React, but in one of the packages that was used by React. And so this dependency made it into React and other big libraries. And there was a naming conflict because this um, package belonged to a contributor that had another package that was called Kick. And the messenger kick, they also wanted to create a library and were saying, hey, we want this name. And so they had this dispute with the um, open source contributor, with NPM. And uh, during the dispute, the contributor just revoked all its packages. And not just uh, kick, but also everything, one of them left pet. And this basically made this day React applications not built. So it nearly broke the internet, right? So. You should be aware of all your dependencies and what dependencies they have. And um, I saw another talk here, I think this day, is, it said, okay, there's also a package that says uh, is, is even or is odd. So there are really JavaScript packages is even, right? Every developer should be able to write this on their own without depending on our packages. So really be careful what dependencies you, uh, you get into your code because you never know when they go, when they break, or if they have vulnerabilities. So what can we do? Software composition analysis, SCA. A software composition analysis um, goes through your dependency trees and analyzes it and, and, and gives you yeah, information about license compliance, about found vulnerabilities, and uh, gives you insights and, and allows you to manage or yeah, to control and manage your dependency tree. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are different tools, dependency track and core. GitHub uh, dependency management. So again, in open source, this is free and just in the product, you can just use it. Under the Intites tab, you can find all your dependencies. And dependencies are not only package JSON, right? So also GitHub Actions is a dependency. Git submodules are a dependency. So a lot of dependencies are supported here and you can analyze them and help you monitor and uh, get a glimpse um, what you're depending on. So there are two frameworks that help you um, with um, yeah, supply chain security. So um, one is called Salsa. So this is the newer one. It's still in, in an early alpha. And one is SCVS from uh, Ubas. And they're basically frameworks that help you to, to like a maturity matrix to go through all your inventory process, right? So inventory, software, bill of materials, build environments, package management, and uh, check if, you're, um, yeah, if, if you have problems at that area. So I'm not going all, all of this right now because this is a talk for each topic of their own, right? Um, but this is something you can be aware of. I just want to highlight one, and this is the bills of material. Yeah. And software bills of material is an interesting topic right now because um, it's like uh, demanded from from uh, from yeah, U.S. government, um, but there's still different standards, and none of the standards is really I don't know I would say everywhere. So it's still a, a very fluctuating topic, and uh, yeah. So what is a bill of material? So if you buy a machine today, you will get a bill of material, and the bill of material contains all the components that make up your product you buy. 
So you can really go back if you have a problem and a part is uh, missing or something and say, okay, this is the part with that version I ordered at that day, right? Um, and the same is here for software, right? So um, it, it's um, a standard that is requested to say, okay, we need a software bill of material that tells us exactly what version we built the software with. And right now we have different standards. For example, the Software Package Data Exchange, SPDX, that is used from SIFT and Encore. And we have um, Cyclone DX, this is the OVAS package. And uh, there's an older one that are software identification tags, SWIT, that are more used in software asset management. And they are like substandards for the others. So, so Cyclone DX or SPDX, they both can use SWIT tags if software are provided to SWIT tags. But SWIT tag is not really uh, so important right now. If you want to go and, and to, do SBOM, I would say uh, SPDX and CDX are the more mature versions. Yeah. But it's just, just a topic that you probably will hear, will hear of if you talk about supply chain security right now. And it's, it's a good topic, but I still think it's not there yet to be 100% used because it also only contains the software tools, right? It does not contain, for example, the build environment. If you use uh, an ephemeral environment and you have documented and locked everything there, it's not necessary, but this should also be part of the uh, software builds of material, right? Okay, what, what server did it build on? What tools were installed? And uh, because this can all affect the build process, so it should be included. And I think there's no solution yet available for that. So what to do? You should know your dependencies and you should keep them up to date. And you should, again, use ephemeral build environments and development environments uh, that are specific this will help you, like uh, if you preach, like uh, yeah, making sure it keeps stays there. And uh, yeah, knowing your dependencies, um, use software composition analysis. And for example, if you're on GitHub, you can use Dependabot and enable it. And this will allow you, or this will help you keeping it up to date. So if a vulnerability is found, they will directly create a pull request for you, so that you can just see what what has changed, and you just have to approve. If you have a build, it will run automatically your tests, and then you can easily merge the fix into your repository. So it's just one click, more or less, to update your dependencies, especially if they have a vulnerability, but you can also use it to update every dependency to normal versions if you want. So, and this is something you really should think about because updating all the packages in this big dependency tree is a lot of work. And the more you automate here, the better and the, better, the higher the chance that your components are up to date. And uh, a big percentage of the vulnerabilities is still because packages are not patched. Yeah? Because people are just too lazy, they want to go into patch, too many uh, versions here, then one is failing and then people just let it. So find a process, automate what you can, for example, just approve um, patches or security updates and only have uh, manual approvals for minor and major versions or something like that. But this is really an area where you should invest, keeping your entire um, supply chain up to date. Vulnerabilities. So, um, of course, now we are at the application, in the heart of the application. Uh, um, you probably know the OVAS top 10. I think I know there was another talk the other day here, um, where they had the OVAS top 10 in depth. So these are the new top 10 of um, yeah, attack vectors to the applications. So number one, still broken access control, uh, cryptographic failures, and uh, number three, injection. So one of the most uh, critical things is still injection. And I'm not going through the OVAS top 10 because this is again is a topic for an entire uh, talk on their own, but I want to highlight injection. So um, 94 of the applications tested for injection um, had an incident rate of 19%. Um, uh, so yeah, max incident rate of 90% on average with 3%. Um, so it's still a very important attack vector for your application. And if we look what common vulnerability enumerators belong to injection, so this is cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and external control of a file name or path. Yeah. And um, I don't know if you're aware of SQL injection, but you should as a developer. What is SQL injection? Well, someone um, bringing user code to your database and executing it, for example modifying the string and you're not um, yeah, um, 
sanitizing the string, I would say. Right? You have to sanitize every user input, and this gives the people ability to execute SQL um, by entering modified strings. This is another example for cross-site scripting. Um, so you should be aware of these kind of attacks, and you should put measures in place. Because, of course, as an experienced developers with a lot of years, you probably know this, and these are uh, errors you're not committing. But you always have to think there are new developers coming and uh, you might not spot it. They modify something, you don't realize it, and, and pop, you'll be vulnerable. Also, there are, of course, these are the obvious ones, right? So, but uh, there are also um, sometimes attacks that are not so easy to spot. So it's not obvious you just have for, forgot to sanitize the string, but uh, you can modify, uh, for, for example, log4j, right? You can modify the way in a string that, that, that it was interpreted by a package and modified and then passed on. So it's really, um, you have to be aware of them and put in place things um, to shift left security and to automatically check for this kind of vulnerabilities. And we call this static application security testing, right? So um, code analysis, we analyze the code. This is, um, this is white, white box testing, right? So uh, for example, GitHub code analysis or SonarCube, SEMgrab, different tools with different capabilities. And what they're doing is they're analyzing your code to, uh, to find uh, vulnerabilities in your code path. And for example, CodeQL from uh, GitHub Advanced Security, so they bought SAML a few years ago, you might remember. And what CodeQL does, it, it generates a database from your code. So actually multiple databases, but it takes your code, it generates a database, and then you have the CodeQL queries. They're open source, they're on GitHub. You can have a look at them. And um, the queries are basically like a query language. So you have a source, user input, database field, something, and you have a sync, execute something, writing to the database, and then the query checks if you have a match and the source matches the thing. And that's because the database knows how your data flows through your application, right? So it's not just a static analysis where it looks at the code and the function, how it looks. It really knows that the user input here is passed into this object here, it's assigned to this variable here, it's assigned here, and it really knows how your data flows through the entire application. So this is a really powerful tool that can help you find vulnerabilities early. Thank you. So, static application security testing is really a, 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 a big improvement if you integrate it in your pipelines and, and execute it as often as possible. And it's important that you, you're not only executing it if you change code, because in the background, there might be new queries, right? So you should also have a, a timed execution that executes it from time to time. Because if there are new queries or new, a new vulnerability is found, they write a query for it, then you should execute this on your code even if nothing changed. So if you change your code base daily, it doesn't matter. If you have code bases that you change uh, only a few times a week or a month, then it's good to have it executed on a regular basis to find something. Dynamic application security testing. So, of course, there's a big gray area between static and dynamic application security testing because a lot of times you still compile the code to do the static analysis. But normally, dynamic, uh, dynamic application security testing is considered like black box testing, right? So you have the application, you run it, and you take it from outside without insights of the application, how they work. For example, uh, OWASP attack proxy. So, um, 
tab, you can, uh, it, it's, it's a standalone application that pen testers normally use. And um, I highly encourage you as a developer to try it out once because it really gives you a, a glimpse how to do it. You can just run and your web application, you get this uh, heads up display and then you can start, uh, I don't know, trying, trying things. But you can also have just this, the, the, the spider and include it in your pipeline and have the sub spider running against your web application and, and like doing all kind of attacks um, like uh, from the perspective of a running web application in production, right? And if you include it in the pipelines, you get earlier feedback if something is wrong or something is broken. For example, someone modified code and disabled something, then you will find it here quite early. So this is what the report looks like, but it's really easy to include it in your pipeline because black box testing does not have a lot of variables, right? So you, you can just execute it, you give it the target URL and it runs. But of course, this is just for web application. And if you want to do this with other kinds of application, it gets much more complicated. Infrastructure scanning. So um, the more infrastructure code we have in our repositories, um, it's a good thing, right? But we still have to ensure that the infrastructure is secure. So um, what you should do is integra integrate um, container scanning or infrastructure scanning into your pipelines to get early feedback to ensure that the policies are right, right? There are different tools available like Encore, Gripe, Clare, or commercial like WhiteSource and Aqua. And um, yeah, this really helps you if you integrate it in your, in your pipeline to um, validate if you have misconfiguration in your infrastructure's code files. Um, yeah. For example, Checkoff. I really like Checkoff. If you never tried it, it's an open source tool. It has more than 1,000 rules available for a lot of for AWS, for Azure, and you can just run it against your infrastructure, infrastructure as code files and you get a lot of warnings, right? So, okay, S3 bucket should not be public and uh, a lot of best practices, it will discover out of the box without modifying any of the rules. Of course, it's extensible. You can write your own school, uh, rules and extend it, but uh, also just using the default uh, gives you really much confidence, uh, much more confidence if you're deploying with infrastructure as code. Yeah, what to do? So. Make sure to shift left and include SAST and DUST in your pipelines and execute it regularly. Make sure you have infrastructure scanning and, and policies in place to check that your infrastructure as code is secure. And yeah, in, in general, um, shift left security and uh, yeah, also include code spaces. I think they're wrong. They should not be here on that slide. So let's stop by shift left security. Yeah, one, uh, one important uh, last point. So now we, we've seen all the, the attack vectors during your development lifecycle and make sure you have one security and information event management that locks all these events from all tools, right? Uh, all your SAS tools, DAS tools, um, secret scanning, code scanning, and all your build events that occur. Make sure to lock them into one central security system so that your, your, your SOC center can easily monitor it, right? Uh, see a lot, of, a lot of environments, they forget it, they have the build environments, test environment and, and, and SOC and this is only production, right? And the other thing is out. And um, with the supply chain, we have to make sure that the entire development supply chain here is also monitored, is also part of the security monitoring. Yeah. So here, um, reference to webbook from Microsoft with some uh, tips on securing your um, DevOps practices, right? So first thing, build a security first culture. Yeah, make security part of your DevOps team and not just um, of some checks that are when, when it's already too late and your application is built. So, so make it really part of your, uh, your, pi of, of your culture, of your teams, and, and make it a first priority for everyone. Um, integrate it in the early stages of the development life cycle, right? You're as a developer, you have to care about security, not someone else that is uh, later on. Um, monitor and observe continuously with purpose and monitor and observe everything, right? Not just production. Embrace everything as code, config as code, infrastructure as code. It's much secure than uh, just doing these things manually. Realize compliance with policies and then secure and visualize your software supply chain. And this is one of the biggest um, yeah, attack vectors right now. Um, 
some dependency in your pipeline because it's really hard to control all of them. Yeah. So I hope I could shift a little bit uh, the discussion and uh, especially create awareness for security. Um, of course, all these topics are this is very high level here, but I think it's really important because a lot of uh, developers, um, I don't know, they have a little bit fear of, of contacting security because it's a complicated topic. And I think it's important to see that um, in your everyday life, it's not a pain, right? If you have good secret scanning, code scanning, um, if everything is just implemented in your pipeline, then it's easy and uh, it should not um, yeah, hurt you. Yeah, it just... You should have the awareness and you should integrate in your teams the regular, regular um, yeah, habits like, uh, like security games, being aware of it and really integrate it and make it part of your integral yeah, process and your culture. Yeah. Okay, with that, uh, yeah, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask them. <laughs>